the Cybersecurity and Compliance Podcast with Craig Petronella. Learn about the most current IT security threats in ransomware, phishing, business email compromise, cyber crime tactics, cyber heist schemes, social engineering scams, as well as hints and tips from leading professionals to help you prevent hackers from penetrating your network and dropping ransomware or malware payloads. This podcast will arm you with the best info to defend your network against the latest cyber crimes. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And now, here's your host, Craig Petronella. Good morning. Today is September 27th, 2023. This is your host, Craig Petronella. We're going to do a little bit of a different spin on our typical podcast. We're going to give you the highlights of the latest and greatest in cybersecurity and compliance news. Today, we have a Cisco Zero Day CVE. 2023-20109 exploit, which is from a Chinese state-sponsored APT or Advanced Persistent Threat called Black Tech. It's been caught hacking into network edge devices using firmware implants to stay hidden and silently hop around corporate networks of the United States and Japanese multinational companies. Now they've said that they had the hackers had to have had elevated privilege. But it's important to note that this is why you should have logging and a SEM solution that is constantly being monitored by either a security operations center or staff on your team of cybersecurity experts if you have them in-house. You should always be knowing um, who's logging in and trying to attempt to exploit old administrative credentials or root credentials. But according to a high-powered joint advisory from the NSA, the FBI, CISA, and Japan's NISC, Black Tech has been observed modifying router firmware on Cisco routers to maintain a stealthy persistence and pivot from international subsidiaries to headquarters in Japan and the United States. Specifically, upon gaining an initial foothold into a target network and gaining admin access to net network edge devices, the Black Tech CyberTech bad actors are often modifying the firmware to hide their activity across the edge devices and for further maintain persistence in the network. To extend their foothold across an organization, black tech attackers are targeting branch routers, which are typically the smaller appliances that are used at remote branch offices that are smaller uh, edge networks um, to extend access to corporate. They're abusing the trusted relationships of the branch routers within the corporate networks that they're targeting. The attackers are then using compromised public-facing branch routers as part of their infrastructure for proxying traffic blending in with corporate network traffic. So it's harder for for the cybersecurity or, or SOC team to identify. So Black Tech has been active since about 2010. They're a prolific Chinese APT that specifically targets government, industrial, technology, media, electronics, and telecommunications, including militaries of the U.S. and Japan. They've traditionally used custom malware, dual-use tools, and living off the land tactics, such as disabling the logging on the routers themselves to cover their tracks. So um, if you've got any comments around this, um, please PM us or send us an email. But as far as um, my perspective on this, I'm Cisco certified. I'm, I'm a big supporter of Cisco as a company. However, I do think that in the past or the recent year, Cisco has really priced themselves into the mid to enterprise market and essentially made themselves unaffordable for most small businesses. Um, but I wanted to highlight the fact that With Cisco and some other companies, you have to have a subscription to get their latest and greatest updates. And if you have an older product and you don't get the updates, that's called a legacy product. And that legacy product is a risk to your network. And so if you think about that for a minute, what devices on your network are legacy and are unable to be patched? Because those devices are going to be the ones that hackers are going to target. 
in regards to Cisco, if you don't have that active subscription, you're not going to get the latest patches. So it's important that when choosing a vendor, you have to look at not just the hardware and the software costs, but also the cost for the maintenance. And if your business can't afford the maintenance or doesn't or isn't able to keep the maintenance active, then you really shouldn't be running that equipment on your network because it's just a matter of time before it's going to be exploited. And that goes for any company, not just Cisco. So you want to choose a company that um, is well-rounded and is affordable for your business and your needs. There's another advisory that was released in regards to um, Johnson Controls and ransomware. So Johnson Controls confirmed that they got hit with a disruptive cyber attack that a group, a ransomware group, claimed that they stole 27 terabytes of information. Now, we talked about ransomware in the past. Ransomware is malware that basically encrypts your computer systems and scrambles your data in an encrypted method so that you can't access it in exchange for a ransom payment from the bad actors. Now, you can recover from a ransomware attack without paying the ransom if you have strong data backup, disaster recovery, and business continuity. Hackers like to drop ransomware or attempt to exploit ransomware onto a victim because they know that most cannot recover. They know that most are not doing the testing around their disaster recovery plan. They're not testing their tabletop exercises and penetration testing and finding gaps in their, their networks to cover themselves. They know that most people are not doing all this extra work to protect their companies. So they know it's easy to get ransomware into their network and force them to pay. So that's um, really why ransomware is so such a hot topic now. But you know, bringing this back to Johnson Controls and their attack, they did confirm that they got hit. They have uh, filed an 8K form with the Security and Exchange Commission that basically said that some of its internal IT and applications were disrupted as a result of the, the cybersecurity incident. They're launching an investigation to figure out what, what you know, the root cause. Um, they're saying that mostly their company and their applications are, are largely unaffected and remain operational. However, they are following their business continuity plan and implementing workarounds for certain operations to mitigate disruptions and continuing to service their customers. However, they have said that they've expected to continue um, with delays and and uh, finding different ways to do things until they get recovered. Um, so they were also saying that this group that claimed um, responsibility is called the VX Underground, and they're known as the Dark Angels behind the attack they've claimed to have stolen 27 terabytes of data from the company system and they're holding it ransom to see if um if johnson controls can recover without it or ideally pay them that's what they want they want the money to be able to um exchange for that data back what um the fbi has released recently is what's called a dual attack where the bad actors will attack somebody like Johnson Controls with a certain variant of ransomware, most commonly the, the following, which would be Avos, Locker, Diamond, Hive, Karakurt, Lockbit, Quantum, or Royal. Those are the top variants that are being deployed in various combinations in what's called a dual ransomware attack. So, they're saying that um, they hit a victim with one of these variants, and then between two to 10 days, they hit them again with a different variant. And they're saying that they're also using custom data theft, wiper tools, and malware to put pressure on the victims to pay up. So the, the double hit punch approach 
is basically a way to speed up. It's a catalyst to get their victims to pay faster. Um, <clears throat> they're saying that the, the dual ransomware variants resulted in a combination of data encryption, exfiltration, and financial losses from the ransomware payments. Second ransomware attacks against an already compromised system could significantly harm the victims' entities. So it's worth noting that dual ransomware attacks are not an entirely new phenomenon. They've been detected as early as May of 2021. Last year, Sophos revealed that an unnamed automotive supplier got hit with a triple ransomware attack, which com comprised of Lockbit, Hive, and Black Cat over a span of just two weeks between April and, and May of 22. Earlier this month, Symantec detailed a 3 a.m. ransomware attack targeting an unnamed victim following an unsuccessful attempt to deliver Lockbit in the target. The shift in tactics boils down to several contributing factors, including the exploitation of two zero-day I'm sorry, including the exploitation of zero-day vulnerabilities and proliferation of initial access brokers and affiliates in the ransomware landscape who can resell access to victim systems and deploy various streams in quick succession. Organizations are advised to strengthen their defenses by maintaining offline backups, monitoring external remote connections, and remote desktop protocol or RDP use enforcing phishing-resistant MFA or multi-factor authentication, auditing user controls, auditing user accounts, and segmenting networks to prevent the spread of ransomware. So we talked about different types of data backup, disaster recovery, and business continuity solutions in the past. We've talked about software, software as a service solutions, they do make solutions that cover Microsoft, um, their ecosystem in Microsoft 365, because as you know, Microsoft and a lot of the big vendors, they don't back up your systems. So you have to use these third-party tools to back up your data. And then you need to do the tabletop exercises and the pen testing to test and make sure that you can recover and that all the data that you were hoping was being captured and backed up by your tools is actually happening. So we strongly advise doing that at least annually. Um, they talked about, you know, security hardening around remote desktop protocol. Back in 2013, it was really common for ransomware actors to drop their payloads through the RDP, RDP port 3389. A simple solution back in 2013 was to simply block port 3389 and ideally in a perfect world, block all of the ports and require the use of a VPN. That's still common today, where you, if you can on your network block all the ports, don't open any ports, don't use any access control lists and force the usage of a VPN. That is the, the best security hardening methodology. Um, but again, you can't rely on one thing to protect your network. Obviously, that's just one, one small layer. Uh, you still want to do the other functions that just have systems in place to back up your data and test those systems with the exercises that we talked about. They talked about enforcing MFA, obviously multi-factor authentication or MFA is super common these days and even required by cybersecurity insurance providers and other risk profile or risk aware vendors. Um, so if you have the capability, you definitely want to leverage it. If you don't have the capability, you should explore options on how you can add that capability into your systems to add that additional layer of protection. And ideally, you want to use MFA systems that are token based on a software authentication app or a hardware proximity token or a combination thereof. Try to avoid a cell phone um, one time pin usage because then that subjects you to some type of sim swap attack obviously you want to audit your users and who's on your networks as far as your if you're using microsoft active directory you want to make sure that you're deleting or disa and or dis disabling any unneeded or unused accounts especially in the admin or ad administrators group 
you um, as a best practice want to disable the um, the administrator's account or make it a um, really long complex password and and don't use it it's better to assign administrators to certain people in your company and only um, give admin access to those that absolutely need it and for a temporary period of time if possible and you want to have a checks and balance as well so you don't want to have just one administrator in your company you should have another person so they kind of you know they help each other and they um they work together for you and there's redundancy there segmenting your networks that is where you can um we talked about enclaves in the past enclaves are a segment of your network that you handle sensitive information and you security harden those systems and they're separate from the met the rest of the network so that's what segmentation is, and it's a networking uh, capability on your firewall as well as your switching with VLANs where you can completely separate separate the network communications so there's no spillover onto the main network. And that helps greatly with security and also makes it more affordable for uh, companies to adopt and comply with the latest security standards like CMMC. So that's your top news for the day in cyber and compliance. So I hope you enjoyed this different approach and let us know in the comments or send us a message and we'll continue carrying on for next week. Thank you guys. Thanks for listening to the Cybersecurity and Compliance Podcast with Craig Petronella. For other episodes and more information, visit PetronellaTech.com. Also visit our other websites, ComplianceArmor.com and blockchainsecurity.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for listening and stay secure.